and welcome to worship here at Roberts Park UMC in downtown Indianapolis on this second Sunday in Lent. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. I'm Pastor Andrew, and it's my pleasure to share with you all in worship today. Wherever you are participating in our worship from online, it is our prayer that today you will be encouraged in your service to the community around you and strengthened in your faith to face the issues of today. The gospel lesson for today has some challenging words for us about being part of the in crowd and what it means to unashamedly follow Jesus in the world today. But first, as we gather this day, let us be reminded of our own work and witness as together we read the mission statement of Roberts Park. We are the heart of downtown. Inspired by Jesus Christ, we live out our faith by serving with compassion, practicing social justice, nurturing meaningful relationships, and welcoming all who seek to experience and share Christ's love. Alan Walker is our liturgist today. Please join me for the call to worship. Let us turn our minds from human things. Our faith in Jesus saves us. Let us set our minds on divine things. Our faith in Jesus saves us. We will deny ourselves and take up our cross. Our faith in Jesus saves us. We will lose all that we may gain all. Our faith in Jesus saves us. Amen. Please join me for the prayer of approach. God, you have given us everything. What can we give in return for our lives? Be our guide on our Lenten journey. Help us to deny ourselves, pick up our cross, and follow Jesus. We welcome the chastening direction in our lives as we worship you today. Amen.
The scripture lesson today is from the Hebrew scriptures. Genesis chapter 17 verses 1 through 7 and 15 through 16. And when Abram was ninety years old and nine, the Lord appeared to Abram and said unto him, I am God Almighty, walk before me and be thou wholehearted. And I will make my covenant between me and thee and will multiply thee exceedingly. And Abram fell on his face and God talked with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with thee, and thou shalt be the father of a multitude of nations. Neither shall thy name any more be called Abram, but thy name shall be Abraham, for the father of a multitude of nations have I made thee. And I will make thee exceedingly fruitful, and I will make thee nations of thee, and kings shall come out of thee. And I will establish my covenant between me and thee and thy seed after thee throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be a God unto thee and to thy seed after thee. And God said unto Abraham, as for Sarai, thy wife, thou shalt not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall her name be. And I will bless her. And moreover, I will give thee a son of her. Yea, I will bless her and she shall be a mother of nations. Kings of peoples shall be of her. Good morning, boys and girls. I want to give a warm welcome to all our young disciples and especially to the boys and girls that are joining us from the garden. Hello! Can you say hello too? We are so glad that you are here. And I'd also like to introduce you to my friend Ted. Yes, you! This is my friend Ted, and today we are going to start by lighting our altar candle to remind us that we are in the presence of Jesus, which is perfect because today's lesson is another lesson about Jesus. So I have my altar candle lit here, and I even decorated my altar bag. Jesus tells this, that we need to take up our cross and follow him. But do you want to know a secret? Do you want to know a secret, Teddy? When we agree to follow Jesus, we take him with us everywhere. That's right. We take him everywhere because Jesus is everywhere. I'm going to read you a story today called This I Know by Clay Anderson and Natalie Merhip. This I Know by Clay Anderson and illustrated by Natalie Merhip. For ever since the world was created, people have seen the earth and the sky through everything God made, they can clearly see his invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature. It's time to get up. Oh, the big day is here. Are we ready to go? I've been waiting all year. It's our day of adventure, our day of exploring, of running and hiking and swimming and soaring. When I went to sleep, it was rainy and cold, but the sun has come out and the sky is like gold. I jump out of bed. There is so much to do. With every new day, God makes everything new. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the sunrise tells me so. Wake up, little girl. You're so precious to me. My sweet baby sister, how cute could you be? I prayed and I asked God to give me a sister, and you're so much more than I could wish for. 
God loves his children, each daughter and son, and he gives us new life just like you, little one. Today I will show you the wonders outside, how all of God's marvelous world is alive. Jesus loves me, this I know, for our baby tells me so. Mom is packing the van like a cozy cocoon, and you know what that means. We are leaving and soon. Like butterflies bursting to try out their wings, we're ready to go and do all kinds of things. It's such a big world full of so much to see, I wish we could fly like the birds in the trees. So what do you think we'll discover? Oh boy, I love days like these that are full of God's joy. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the butterflies tell me so. We're here at the beach and my toes love the sand. We splash in the waves as they crash onto land. The seagulls are squawking, the air's full of smells. I'm spying for dolphins and hunting for shells. Just look at that water so deep and so wide and brimming with life that is swimming inside. My dad says it makes him feel small like a child. God's world so big and so wondrous and wild. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the ocean tells me so. We're on the road over slow rolling hills, but our sweet little dog doesn't want to sit still. With a wag of her tail, she's ready to run in a wide open field in the warmth of the sun. Wherever I go, she's right by my side on bright happy mornings or nights when I've cried. She makes us all laugh, she's always so playful, but what I love most is how God made her faithful. Jesus loves me, this I know, for our puppy tells me so. A flash in the sky, oh please say it's not true. I can't, it can't rain today, the sky has to stay blue. But thunder rolls in with a rumble and boom. If it doesn't stop raining, our day will be doomed. But that's when mom smiles and reminds us to say, it's all in God's hands, so we wait and we pray. A lightning bolt cracks and my poor brothers cower. Though storms can be scary, we trust in God's power. Jesus loves me, this I know, even thunder tells me so. Oh, can you believe it? The clouds have blown by and a rainbow is stretching across the blue sky. When we don't expect it, God loves to surprise and sometimes the storms are his grace in disguise. Our day isn't over, it's just getting started. The road up ahead is completely uncharted. So what will we find up the steep mountain slope? Whatever's ahead, we are all filled with hope. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the rainbow tells me so. We hop from the van and start hiking a trail over brooks and on boulders, up hills and down vales. And there at the top as we round the last bend, just look at that view like the world has no end. God's world is so big, could he ever know me? But he knows every sparrow and every last bee. And there in the rocks, he knows each flower blossom, so fragile and frail on a mountain so awesome. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the mountains tell me so. Then just a bit further, right up the peak, I feel something gentle and cold on my cheek. Floating down from the sky, landing right on my tongue. Look, each tiny flake is like no other one. The snow gently falling is quiet and bright. 
a magical wonderland sparkling in white. God blankets the world in a loving embrace with fresh fallen snow like amazing new grace. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the snowflakes tell me so. Back down the mountain, arrived at our camp, Dad sets up the tent and we all grab our lamps. Mom, do you mind if we go on a hike? We're off to explore by the warm evening light. Surrounded by piles of red, orange, and brown, we kick them and crunch them and toss them around. The leaves are now fading, all done with their duty, and yet every season is filled with God's beauty. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the fall leaves tell me so. And as the sun slowly sinks, a red glow in the sky, a new light appears. It's as small as a fly. A twinkle, a blink as I reach out to snatch him. He flits all about till finally I catch him. He crawls on my finger so patient and slow and flashes his tail like he's saying, hello. A bug that lights up? Oh, it just makes me ponder. Is there no end to God's marvelous wonder? Jesus loves me, this I know, for the fireflies tell me so. Beneath a clear sky in a wide open field, we sit in the grass and we keep our eyes peeled and patiently wait until, look, shooting star, a streak through the sky, it's so near but so far. The light of the stars through the shadows of space Travel millions of miles to brighten my face. God is here and he's there and he's always wherever. He's now and he's then and he will be forever. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the universe tells me so. Oh, what a wonderful day this has been. We've had so much fun, I don't want it to end. It's so full of memories we'll always keep, but now it is late, so it's time for some sleep. Snuggled tight in our tent with a smile on my face, my whole family is here, it's my happiest place. The crickets are chirping, all others have ceased. As their melody lulls me, I rest in God's peace. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the crickets tell me so. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. We are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. The end. Wow, did you like that story? Did you like that story, Teddy? I really like that story too. So now we're gonna get out our week two Lent activity. And in our week two Lent activity, you are going to find a reminder that Jesus is with us everywhere and he's with us all the time. So everybody has different kinds of animal stickers. Some are from the ocean and some are dinosaurs. And this one even has a llama. So you can use the stickers to decorate your sackcloth for your altar, or you can use them for a fun project of your own. But just remember that Jesus is with you all the time. And so as we begin to end this lesson today, we want to go to our candles. Each Sunday we've been putting out a candle as we count down the Sundays in Lent. This Sunday we extinguish the second candle and remember that Jesus is everywhere 
all the time. At least I didn't blow out too. Will you pray with me? Dear God, thank you for sending your son Jesus to show us how to be kind, just, and loving people. Help us to be brave and tell people about Jesus and how much he loves them. Amen. Join me now as we hear these words from St. Mark for our gospel reading. It comes from chapter 8, verses 31 through 38. Jesus foretells his death and resurrection. Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed and after three days rise again. He said all of this quite openly, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any want to become followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? For those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. This is the gospel of the risen Christ. Thanks be to God. Amen.
I had to have a difficult conversation this past week. It was difficult insofar as it was with someone I know to be an intelligent person, someone I felt was a grounded individual. And yet it was difficult as this person is totally consumed by QAnon conspiracy theories and the big lie. This individual is firmly convinced the election was stolen from Donald Trump and that Trump alone can save America from a cabal of Satan-worshipping, cannibalistic pedophiles who are running a global child sex trafficking ring and plotted against the former US President Donald Trump. My conversation was not to try and disavow this individual of their position. I wanted to try and understand how such thinking fits into a life that in, well, all other areas such as finance and investing in the stock market and supporting their local church and many other areas seems to be in line with what one might call normal. It didn't appear that the individual's belief in QAnon and the big lie was influencing their behavior. So I left the conversation feeling even more baffled than before it. In reflecting on my exchange, I did begin to appreciate how difficult it sometimes is to hold a belief, a way of thinking, in opposition to what the vast majority of others may think is simply not true. It's cool to be cool. Everyone loves to feel that they are part of something bigger than themselves, part of something amazing, part of a great project, a fantastic mission, an exciting team, a member of the cool crowd. We feel good when we have a sense of shared identity with others, especially one that makes us feel appreciated or wanted or engaged or valued. But what happens when others in our lives think that our cool is not so hot? What does it mean when the cool crowd turns out to be the wrong crowd, at least in everyone else's eyes? How do you weather that kind of critique, that worry, the doubt, the sometimes rejection of your judgment of yourself by your family, your friends, your colleagues, your church members, or a social circle? Will you pray with me? All-knowing God, help us to be the masters of ourselves that we might truly be the servants of others. Take our minds and think through them. Take our lips and speak through them. Take our hands and do your good works. Take our lives and live out your life. Take our hearts and set them on fire with love for you. Amen. Some of you undoubtedly have had that conversa conversation experience that I had. Many maybe felt that you were the subject of it. Or maybe you watched your son and daughter go through it, that situation when your eyes are opened and you realize your best friends and buddies are seen as troublemakers, as a gang of misfits and miscreants, a band of bad boys, a bunch of nerds or obnoxious brainiacs. For some, this realization sparks a collision of identity and doubt and fear of exclusion and fear of rejection. Even if we've done nothing wrong, we feel wrong by association. Or we feel we may be forever labeled. It might affect our future. 
It might affect our career. Peer pressure is a powerful thing. Social pressure is even more powerful. The pressure to conform can be sometimes overwhelming, overpowering, stressful, and defining. Your family and friends are telling you, disassociate now for your own good. Don't believe what they say to you. They aren't your real friends and family. They don't really care about you. Meanwhile, your crowd keeps saying, well, this is where it's at. And the leader of the crowd tells you, you can leave if you want, if you're ashamed to be seen with me. And now you're trapped between a rock and a hard place. What do you do? You feel pressured by both sides. One wants you to toe the conformity line, and the other wants you to stay true to the group. You begin to doubt yourself. Could they be troublemakers? Am I the only one who's not seeing it? Am I really seeing things the right way? Have I been brainwashed? Where is my heart? Where should it be? You know, to stand tough in a situation like this, to know who you are and to be clear about your associations is not as easy as it looks. When you do stand up for your principles, what if you discover those principles were wrong? Do you listen to the voices around you that you've trusted all your life? Do you trust in someone's promises even despite the way things look? Now, as much as we'd like to think we're all about it, caring what others think is part of our vital social DNA. We all have a sense of honor that is mostly defined by our culture, our social context, our families, and even our churches. We all follow unwritten codes of decorum and behavior and thought and even identity. When we defy that honor, we can not only begin to doubt ourselves, but we can be ostracized by our peers, labeled by our societies, misjudged, stamped as troublemaker. Does that mean that we actually are? You know, in Jesus' time, his community, his Jewish society, his family too knew an honor code. One defined by Jewish traditions and laws, one that put family and respect for authority first. And if that code was breached by you, you could bring dishonor and shame and embarrassment upon the entire family, the entire community who knew you and supported you. The word for this in Greek was epi shukamai. Epi shukamai means to be ashamed of someone, to be personally disgraced by your association with someone, to be wronged, aligned, wrongly aligned with somebody, to disagree. to be part of the wrong crowd or associating with the wrong person. This is the word Jesus used to describe his disciple struggle. At this point, already in Jesus' ministry, things were beginning to heat up. Jesus was a wild card. He'd asked his disciples to leave their families during Shiva, to leave their care of their parents, to thwart Jewish customs, to defy temple leadership, and to engage in proclaiming a narrative that most around them felt to be ridiculous, outlandish, or simply dangerous. Being a disciple of Jesus was a risky business. Some thought he was a reckless revolutionary, some a dangerous provocateur, some a misguided rabble-rouser, others just downright crazy. Following this out-of-the-box rabbi, well, it had started as fun, but now it was beginning to be questionable, risky, and could threaten their own well-being, their own very lives. Were they ashamed to be seen with Jesus? Ashamed of his behavior, afraid of those who have placed a death threat on his head? 
Were they ashamed to be seen beside him as everyone around him seemed to call him a heretic, a danger, a loony, an evil? Were they ashamed to be associated with a criminal who would ultimately be put to death in the most shameful method known to society, naked on a cross? Were these loyal men, the closest in Jesus' inner circle, actually buckling under the pressure of dishonor by association? Well, let's see. Judas would crack and betray him. The last straw when that woman wasted an entire vial of expensive oil. Peter would deny him, claiming not to know him for fear of the temple guards. And the other disciples would hide, afraid of being associated with the criminal Jesus. Most of Jesus' followers, thousands in number, would magically disappear the moment things got testy for fear of their own lives. When Jesus tells us today, as disciples and his church, to stand tall in the face of criticism, to proclaim him in the face of ridicule and doubt, to defend him in the face of agnosticism, to uphold him when things get tough, he knows how hard that is. The gospel in its own time was revolutionary, shocking, sacrilegious. Jesus' closest disciples faltered in the face of accusation. And the gospel today is no less shocking to people who don't know Jesus. And standing with Jesus in the face of critique, doubt of atheism and disdain, is still just as hard. Jesus knows that faith is more challenging than a simple recitation or knowledge of a creed. True faith requires a kind of identity in Jesus that is sure in the face of pressure and solid when life crumbles. Is Jesus a troublemaker? You bet he is. He troubles our hearts of sin. He troubles our minds in doubt. He troubles the waters of contention. He troubles the weeds of hypocrisy. He troubles our sentence of death. He troubles everything we have been taught to believe in and challenges us to see it anew. Being a disciple of Jesus requires us to put aside everything society expects from us, that our families may know about us, that our mind may challenge about what we know as real and true and asks us to follow our hearts. For when Jesus is Lord of your heart, nothing can deter your spirit. The Church of Jesus Christ now, more than ever, is facing challenges of doubt and despair and destitution. Will you be ashamed? to be seen with Jesus? Can you trust your faith is real, your prayers, your hopes? Will you stand by him, stay with him, walk with him even to the cross? Because you trust in resurrection. May the Spirit of Christ be with you now and always. Amen. Thank you so much for your message, Pastor Andrew. And now that we have heard the word of God proclaimed and we've had the chance to ponder it in our hearts and our minds, it is our honor and privilege to be able to approach the throne of God, to be able to enter the throne room with our prayers and with our petitions. When you hear the words, Lord, hear our prayers, please respond with, and in your love, answer. Would you pray with me? Oh Lord, we give you thanks for the example of Abraham and for all the saints who have gone before us, for those who waited in patience for your promises to come to pass, for those who lived in hope 
while around them it seemed to be only darkness. For those who witnessed to you when it was not considered the proper thing to do, for those who forgot their own selves and their desire to obey your commands and respond to your call upon their lives. Help us today, O oh God, to examine the level of our faith, to look seriously at our resistance to talk about the cross and about sacrifice, and to consider in prayer our reluctance to give up the things of this world, to risk our reputations, our comfort, and our security for the sake of following you, for the sake of witnessing to you, for the sake of obeying you. Lord, hear our prayer, and in your love, answer. We pray, O oh Lord, that you would make us bold in our faith by our self-forgetting, our self-denial, Help us make visible to all our brothers and sisters the reality of your power and care. That power and care that is so often made evident when we confess our weaknesses. The weaknesses that we so often conceal from others when we are strong. Lord, hear our prayer. And in your love, answer. We pray, O oh Lord, for those peoples whose names or faces or needs are resting on our hearts, for the members of our church whose health is failing as they age, for those believers whose families are struggling to deal with teenage rebellion and adult confusion and uncertainty, for those who have little or no faith and who seem to be lost even though your light shines around them, and your word is close at hand. Lord, hear our prayer, and in your love, answer. We pray, O oh Lord, for those in our family, our church, our community, and our world that you bring to our hearts and mind at this time, and we hold them up to you with the words of our lips and the meditations of our heart. Lord, we pray for all of those that are in Texas and for all of those that are in the South that are still dealing with the ramifications of this bitter winter, who are living without power, without water, and who are struggling to provide for their families. We pray that in your grace and in your mercy and in your strength that you would be there providing the support and the sustenance that they need. Lord, hear our prayer, and in your love, answer. All these things we pray too through your son, Jesus, who died that we might live and who lives that we might never die. Amen. And now, Lord, hear us as we pray the prayer that your son taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us of our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.
And so as we move to the close of our time together in worship, again, I would ask church members and friends to let us know in the comments section of Facebook of your presence with us and how many are watching with you. I know that for many of you, these times are financially challenging as well as being difficult in many other ways. But for those who are able to financially support the church at this time, can I remind you that you can give to the church ministries online through the website using the giving tab or by posting your contribution check to the church office. If you're not a member of the church and yet are a regular viewer of our services, or if you have found us for the very first time today, then please do let us know how we can get in touch with you as we have a small gift that we'd like to send you as a welcome to our congregation. You can email the church office at rpoffice at robertsparkumc.org and we'll add you to our midweek mailing. I'd also encourage you to follow us on Facebook and subscribe to our church YouTube channel. Before I share in a benediction, can I say that the little survey that was sent out these past couple of weeks about worship at Easter has shown overwhelming support from those who responded for a service here in the sanctuary at 10.30 on Easter Sunday. That weekend is also the final four weekend for the NCAA basketball tournament being held here in Indiana and in Indianapolis in particular. Easter Sunday is the rest day between the final four on Saturday and the championship game on Monday. And given that visiting fans will be in the city, it's quite possible that we'll have some visitors here too. There'll be a lot more following about details, about precautions to be taken and the need for social distancing. But I hope you might consider joining us online or in person on that day. And now, go forth with the voice of God calling your name. Go forth to hear Christ claiming you as your own. Go forth to follow where the Spirit sends you. Go forth called, named, and claimed by God. Amen.